Once upon a time, there was a 17-year-old kid. I don't know that you can call a 17-year-old a kid. Maybe it depends on how old you are and whether they're a kid or not. I guess a 17-year-old should be considered a young man. But anyway, 17-year-old kid was his father's favorite. His dad spoiled him unbelievably and did not hide the fact that he was the favorite. Everybody knew that of all the children from these parents, this young man, this 17-year-old boy was the favorite. Dad loved him the most. The favoritism was so blatant that Dad couldn't even let him go out to work with the rest of his brothers, with the rest of the family. He had to stay back at home where he was safe, where Dad could keep an eye on him. He didn't want his son hurt. That made his brothers pretty angry, pretty upset. In addition to being disliked by his brothers because of the favoritism, they also hated him because he was honest. And because he wasn't afraid to call them up to account for things that they had done. In fact, there's even one account recorded where he brings a, an evil report to his father about what his brothers are doing when they're out away from home, when they're not close, and their jobs took them away sometimes for days, even weeks at a time. They hated him because he was honest. And maybe because he tattled. To add insult to injury, told them about his dreams. He told them that he had dreamt that there was coming a day when his mother and his father would bow down to him. In fact, he said there's coming a day when all of my family will bow down and do obeisance to me, will pay me homage. You can imagine that even though it wasn't necessarily his intention, his words simply further alienated him from his brothers. And at that point, even to a certain degree, from his father and mother. And then one day it happened. His brothers were out working and they'd been gone for some time and his father said, you need to go take some food to your brothers. You need to go make sure they're doing okay and then come back and report on how the job is going. And they were quite a ways away. It actually took a couple days for him to get there to find them and get the message. And when his brothers saw him coming, when they saw him coming in the distance, they knew that this was their chance to get their revenge. They grabbed him, they roughed him up, they jerked off his outer cloak, they beat him up a little bit, and then they tossed him, they tossed him into an empty pit until they could decide what they would do with him. Initially, their plan was to kill him, just kill him. Go tell Dad something, we just need to kill him. We're so, we're so sick and tired of him and all his little privileges. But initially their plan was to kill him, and then they heard a noise, and they turned around, and there was this group of Ishmaelites coming. And so they took Joseph, and they dragged him out of that pit, and they sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. That was the price of his, that was the going price for a slave. Now that caravan of Ishmaelites, or Midianites, uh, went down to Egypt, and Joseph was sold into slavery. Joseph spent many years either in slavery, or in prison for some things that he had never done. He had never done anything wrong. He had never committed a crime. He had never asked to be the favorite son. He had never asked to receive the dreams. He had never chosen or asked for God to choose him. Now we know we know Joseph's life and we can look and say, yeah, yeah but see where he ended up. He ended up at the, the pinnacle of Egypt. He was second only to Pharaoh. He was the vice in fact, and there were times that during the famine and then the, the years of plenty that Pharaoh deferred to him. Now, Pharaoh always had final say, but, but Joseph was the viceroy. He was the second most powerful person in the most powerful nation in the world. But understand that he spent many, many years suffering, slavery, prison, mistreatment. We are told in Genesis chapter 37, verse 2, that he was 17 years old when he was sold into slavery by his brothers. We are told in Genesis, it's 
in Genesis 41, 46, that he was 30 years old when he interpreted the Pharaoh's dream. He spent 13 years suffering. He spent 13 years dealing with injustice and humiliation. In our second lesson, as we walk through this journey to forgiveness, we begin by addressing what is the issue that you chose? Now remember, last week you had the assignment. Your assignment was to decide what offense, what hurt, what area are you going to use or what area are you going to deal with on this, your first journey through or to forgiveness. I hope that you've all given that some prayerful thought. I hope you've all come to a, a situation and said, this is what I need to deal with before God. This is where I need to go for now. And there, there may be other journeys. There may be other issues. But where do I need to start? I hope that you have come up with that. And we're going to talk about that in Sunday school uh, quite a bit more. But I hope you, uh, you've kept your assignment that you, you've chosen an issue. That you, you've done some inner soul searching and said, God, this is where I need to be. And as we think about emotional and psychological and even physical injury and physical hurt that we sustain, there's some truths that we need to know. Okay, there's some truths that we need to know. First of all, feelings are all right. Let's talk about feelings, okay? Now, stereotypically, every man in the room just took a step backwards. And every woman in the room goes, yes! Stereotypes tell men that they cannot share feelings where women are given the green light to share feelings. Which, by the way, is why women live longer than men. They don't hold it in like us tough men. We die earlier than they do because we don't have the brains to release depression. Sorry, guys. But breathe a sigh of relief. I'm not going to ask you to share your feelings. But this is what I am going to tell you. Feelings are valid. The feelings that we, we experience, the emotions that we have when it, when it comes to being hurt are valid. The emotions or thoughts caused by injury, caused by an offense, are valid. Let's look at two examples. Number one, we're going to look at a very specific example. And then I want to look at Joseph and some of the things that he dealt with. As an example, let's consider the emotion of fear, okay? We read in 2 Timothy 1.7, and it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. And so we read that verse, and we errantly believe that Christians aren't supposed to be afraid. Christians aren't supposed to be afraid. We begin to think, well... Well, I must be doing something wrong because this situation scares me or, 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 or this offense is scary or, or that I'm afraid to be alone or be with that person. We think, well, there's something wrong with my Christian life because I've experienced this emotion of fear. When we downplay fear or any emotion for that matter, we put ourselves at risk. We put ourselves at risk of damage, either inward and sometimes even outward damage. Emotions are two things. They're a release for pent-up energy, and they're a way for us to express what's going on inside. Emotions tell people, or even tell us, what's happening inside, which can't be seen. If we're hurt physically, if we're hurt Somehow we can show the bruise, we can show the cut, we can we can show the an X-ray can show the broken bone. But if we are hurt emotionally or mentally, there's nothing to show. And so suddenly we think, well, that's not a hurt because it doesn't do anything. No, it does hurt. And that's what emotions are. That's one of the things that our emotions are for is to show us and to show people the hurt that's inside. Plus. Believing that Christians cannot express fear is not biblical. We know that because Psalm 56.3 says, Whenever I am afraid, this is David, Whenever I am afraid, Whenever I am afraid, 
I will trust in you. I will trust in you. Suddenly, put in the proper context, we talked about context last week, but put in the proper context, fear becomes a valid emotion. I can experience fear in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. I don't let it dictate what I do. I don't let this fear control me. Because as we talked about three weeks ago, the, the, one of the, the part of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So I don't let this fear dictate what I do. But that doesn't mean I don't experience it. It doesn't mean it's not a valid emotion that I walk through. And so we have to, first of all, when it, when it comes to forgiveness, when it comes to dealing with forgiveness, we have to recognize the hurt is real. The emotions are okay. Properly and appropriately expressed, emotions are a good thing. Okay, so number one, emotions are valid. Second, let's take a look at Joseph. Let's take a look at the emotions that Joseph felt. Now you put, your, put yourself in his place. In essence, he's alone, okay? Uh, he knows his brothers hate him. He knows. He knows that there's, there's no love lost between his brothers and himself. So he approaches his brothers and they begin to attack him. And, and as the ten brothers become more and more aggressive, he begins to feel fear. He begins to feel anxiety. He is suddenly scared. He can't fight off these ten strapping shepherds. and He can't fight them off. He begins to experience fear. Uh, when they take off his multicolored coat, they stomp it on the ground, he begins to experience confusion. What, what are they doing? What, what's the big deal about this coat? What's this big deal about this cloak? And then as he sits at the bottom of that pit, his feelings of betrayal, of a, he feels trapped, resentment, helpless, rejection, shame, grief, confusion, anger, depression. And, as, and then as they haul him out of the pit and hand him over bound to the slave traders, inadequacy, helplessness, worthlessness. But for Joseph is at this position. There is nothing, there is nothing at this point to be happy about or to be peaceful about or anything. He doesn't know what's happening. He just knows that he is feeling horrible. All these emotions just well up within him. And none of these emotions are wrong. Not one. Now we, we follow Joseph's life through the book of Genesis. We realize that he rises to the top of his master's house, Potiphar's house. We realize that he then rises to the pinnacle of Egypt. Except for, except for Pharaoh, he is the most powerful man. So we, we know that he keeps those emotions under control. We know that he holds those emotions in check. But understand that none of those emotions were wrong. Your feelings are valid. When we shed tears, that's okay. When we are angry, that's okay. When we are upset or frustrated or, or, or grief-stricken or whatever, they're okay. Now, they don't control us. That rage, that anger cannot control us. Remember, fruit of the Spirit is love to be self-control. Okay? They don't control us. But they're not wrong. We need to embrace that and accept that. Going back to the example of fear, we're not characterized by fear. We don't commit to that fear. It's not who we are. But it is something that we experience. Okay? So truth number one, truth number one, we are, I mean, our emotions are valid. We can express those appropriately and in the, in the control of the Holy Spirit. But it's okay to express whatever emotion you might be going through. The next truth that we need to know is that it's not our fault. When it comes to forgiveness and forgiving people, understand this, it's not your fault, okay? It's not your fault. I read two very difficult articles this week. came out of two psychological magazines or psychology magazines. It, they almost made me physically sick to read them. One was called Self-blame uh, self and perceived control in abusive situations by a woman who's only identified as Bria. 
The second was an article entitled, Blaming Victims for Domestic Violence, How Psychology Taught Us to Be Helpless, by a woman by the name of Zoe Krupka. Did you know that in the United States of America, in, civilized, in the civilized United States of America, every three hours, a woman is admitted to the hospital because she was beat up by their insignificant men. Did you get that? Every three hours, a woman is admitted to the hospital because she was beat up by her insignificant man. That's 56 a week. That's 2,912 a year. And that doesn't even count the thousands who, don't, who aren't allowed to go to the hospital. That doesn't count the thousands who are emotionally abused or mentally abused and don't get to go because there's nothing to show on the outside. Thousands of women in this country are abused on a daily basis. And you know what doctors and nurses and counselors hear? Yeah, I know he hit me, but I probably deserve it because I'm not that good of a girlfriend. Well, yeah, I know he hits me when he's angry, but... You know, I ask a lot of dumb questions. My fault. What? Are you serious? We, we teach women that it's okay to be beat up? We teach, we teach the, uh, children or, or whoever that it's okay to emotionally abuse someone who had a bad day. I know I was mean to you. I know I disparaged you. I know I humiliated you in front of your friends, but I was having a bad day, so it's okay. I tell you what, if you think I'm upset now, you should have seen me when I was reading the articles. <laughs> Hokey smokes, it's a good thing they're on my computer. Or maybe it's a bad thing, maybe Paul's flew out the window. <laughs> we, so they, these women come into the hospitals and, and, and they've been abused, or we, we meet people that have been emotionally abused or, or mentally abused, and, and they think it's their fault. Because that's what we teach them. Well, why didn't you ask so many, why didn't you ask so many questions? Well, why didn't you leave? Well, why did you dress that way? Well, why did you make a why did you excuse me? Excuse me? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna break away with just one paragraph. I'll try to keep it in one paragraph. I'm gonna read it in fact. If you are abused, and that includes physical abuse, mental abuse, or emotional abuse, if you are abused by another person in any way, you are not at fault. Okay? You are not at fault. It is not your fault, even in the slightest. Blame for abuse lies entirely on the lack of the abuser. Completely, 100%. They choose to abuse. They choose to beat you up. They choose to disparage you. They choose to belittle you in front of your friends. They choose to make fun of you. It is never the fault of the victim, ever. Okay, that's two paragraphs. I don't want to make light of this. Like I said, those articles almost made me physically sick. And, and I'm, not even re I'm not even telling you everything that was in the articles. If you want, oh my God. Let's go back to the account of Joseph. Okay? I read over the course of my career, I've gone, read different things on Joseph. And there are authors that either intimate or directly state, directly say that Joseph was partially at fault for his brother's actions. They say that, that he should not have been so open about the dreams or he was, that he was favored by his father. One man writes this, uh, we're not sure if Joseph bragged about these dreams or if he told the dreams to his brothers in an innocent way. No matter how Joseph meant it, when he talked about the dreams, it made his brothers really angry. Everyone gets angry sometimes. We can't even blame Joseph's brothers for, for being angry when they were treated unfairly. 
in my time here in this church. And I know this is where some of you are. You know, we keep talking about, let's forgive something that happened in the past. Let's for I know that some of you are in this situation now. But these are ongoing hurts. And, and how does that all come to play? To be honest, I don't know. We'll work through those things. We'll work towards that. But it is not. Take that burden of guilt off you. Give it back to the abuser. Throw it back at him. Gently. Don't carry that burden of their guilt. Willing to have, be willing to be emotional, be willing to let go of what is not yours. As I said earlier, I'm hoping that in this little walk in 14 weeks, that our hearts will hurt. I'm hoping that, that there'll come points where we have to deal with difficult issues, hard issues, that that God will walk us through maybe some things that we've ignored or maybe didn't recognize, and we have to be careful. I don't want to. <laughs> Regression therapy, I don't want to get into that whole thing. I don't necessarily believe in that. But genuine hurts and maybe we have glossed over or pushed back or whatever. I'm hoping that those come up and as we dredge those things up, there may be pain. But some of that pain is necessary for the helping processing of forgiveness. So let God serve, let God use you, let God guide you in that. And then the second thing. Let those, so as we do that, remember those two things. Emotions are valid and necessary for healthy processing and forgiveness. And number two, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. Let's pray. Heavenly 